I wanted to understand why does depression and anxiety seem to be rising so much? When I was a teenager, I'd gone to my doctor, I'd explained that I was in this deep sense of pain, and all my doctor did was tell me a biological story, just said basically your brain's broken, and all he did was give me drugs. I was still depressed all that time I was taking these drugs. And after 13 years of it, I thought, right, I need to understand what's really going on here. So I ended up going on this big, long journey over 40,000 miles, interviewing the leading experts in the world on what causes depression and anxiety and what solves them. And what I discovered is that we told a ridiculously simplistic story to people about what depression is and how to solve it. It required this kind of shift in my mind, because what I was basically told by my doctor is, your pain is a malfunction. He said, we know what causes depression, it's just some people naturally have low levels of serotonin in their brains, you're clearly one of them, that's what's going on here. And one thing that was really striking, speaking to the leading experts in the world, is that story is just not true. There are real biological factors, there are real things that happen in your brain, obviously. But actually, it's deeply misleading and unscientific to say depression is just caused by low serotonin. One thing that was so important to me was realising, actually, our pain makes sense. If you're depressed, if you're anxious, you've been told, basically, that you're a bit crazy, there's something not working. But actually, you're not a machine with broken parts. You're a human being with unmet needs, and that requires a very different set of responses. And I think what this opens up is a different way of thinking about depression. So what we've done up to now is we've said to depressed and anxious people, the job of fixing this is basically on you, buddy. Maybe if you're lucky, your family, maybe if you're lucky, your doctor. Everyone listening to this, everyone watching this knows that they have natural physical needs, right? You need food, you need water, you need clean air, you need warmth. If I took those things away from you, you would be in real trouble real fast, right? right. There's equally strong evidence that human beings have natural psychological needs. You've got to feel you belong. You've got to feel your life has meaning and purpose. You've got to feel that people see you and value you. You've got to feel that you've got autonomy. You've got to feel that you've got a future that makes sense. And our culture is good at lots of things, I'm glad to be alive today, but our culture has been getting less and less good at meeting these deep underlying psychological needs for lots of people. So I'll give you one example. I noticed that lots of the people I know who are depressed and anxious, their depression and anxiety focuses around their work. What's going on here? So I started to look for evidence about how people feel about their work. Best research on this was done by Gallup, the opinion poll company. Massive detailed study took a couple of years. What they found is 13% of us, 1-3%, basically like our work. Most of the time we get energy from it. 63% of us are what they called sleep working. So don't like their work, don't hate their work, they're just kind of enduring it. And 24% of people fucking hate their work, right? Fear it and dread it. So I was quite struck by that when I looked at it. That means 87% of people don't like the thing they're doing most of the time. And bear in mind, this thing that we don't like has spread over even more of our lives, right? Average person answers their first email at 7.48 a.m. and leaves work at 7.15 p.m. So this is most of our waking lives we're doing something we don't like. I start to think... Could there be some connection between that and this epidemic of awful sort of forms of despair, anxiety, depression, addiction? So I started to look for scientists who'd studied this. I discovered an amazing Australian social scientist called Professor Michael Marmot, who I got to know, who discovered the key to what causes depression at work. The core of it is 
if you go to work and you are controlled, so you feel you have low or no control, you are radically more likely to become depressed. You're even more likely to have a stress-related heart attack. Human beings need to feel our lives have meaning, right? And if you're controlled all the time, you don't feel like your life has meaning. It disrupts your ability to create meaning out of your work. Mm. And it makes you feel like shit. But actually, once you begin to realize that the reasons why people are depressed and anxious make sense, this is just one of many reasons why people are depressed. So what you've got to do is deal with the problem in the world as well as the problem just in the individual skull. Just like we all know, junk food has taken over our diets and made us physically sick. Something similar has happened with our minds, the kind of junk values have taken over our minds. So we all know how that works, right? Junk food appeals to the part of us that evolved to want nutrients, but it tricks that it's not actually a part of you that wants nutrients, it actually makes you sick. So for thousands of years, philosophers have said, if you think life is about money and status and showing off, you're going to feel like shit. It's not an exact quote from Confucius, but that's the gist of what he said, right? To put it crudely, there's two kinds of motives that human beings have. Imagine if you play the piano. If you play the piano in the morning because you love it and it gives you joy, that's called an intrinsic motive to play the piano, right? You're not doing it to get anything out of it. You're just doing it because you love it. The experience is the point. Now imagine you play the piano in a dive bar to pay the rent and you don't like it. That would be an extrinsic reason to play the piano, right? You're not doing it for the thing itself. You're doing it to get something out of it. The more you are driven by extrinsic values, the more your life is guided by how you look to the outside, by what you're trying to get out of life rather than enjoying it, the more you will become depressed and anxious by quite a large margin. There's loads of studies that show this. We have become much more driven by these values over the last 30 years for all sorts of reasons. From the minute we're born, we're immersed in a machine that tells us life is about consumption, about externally consuming things. More 18-month-old children know what the McDonald's M means than know their own last name. So there's this machine constantly geared towards getting us to think extrinsic. Imagine an advert that said to you, you know, Joe, you look great today. You smell great, you're doing fine, right? You don't need to buy anything today. That would, from the perspective of the advertising industry, be the worst, worst advert ever, right? It wouldn't make you want to buy anything. So this movement towards these kind of junk values it just corrodes the quality of your relationships. If you think your wife loves you, not because you're you, but because you're rich, because you look good, or for some other reason, then think about the insecurity that enters into that relationship. You know, oh right, if you suddenly got fat, or if you suddenly lost all your money, it's over. creates that a sand of insecurity enters all your relationships. The more you're extrinsically motivated, the more insecure your relationships will be and the worse you'll feel. I go through in the book lots of things people can do. Some of them are coming together and fighting for collective solutions and some of the things people can do on their own. I don't want to be misleading about this. I don't think there are very good individualistic solutions in a society that's falling apart, where people are profoundly lonely, where they've been taught to value the wrong things, where the inequality is going off the scale, where they are humiliated and controlled at work. I don't want to be saying to an individual person, hey, here's my little solution for you. It needs a big solution, right? 
Now there are smaller things that people can do, even if you're in solitary confinement, in a prison for the rest of your life, there are things you can do. Of course, I don't want to belittle the possibility of individuals to do things, but the most important thing we can do is come together. I would say the single most important thing is, if you possibly can, get to a group of people who feel like you. Who can see that they're upset, who can see that they're wounded, and are seeking a solution together. Partly what I learned is the struggle is the solution. The act of coming together and saying, we've been made to feel like this through no fault of our own. The problem here isn't with me. There is a dignity in asserting that, in showing it to other people, in standing with other people. Find those people. And if you are so wounded you can't do that, okay, then help is on the way. If you can't fight for yourself, we will try to fight for you.